kicking a dying woman. Owning the police, that was like going way too far. Out of palliative care. They said, come home, come home to mom's house, I said. What was the doctor thinking? I think it, you'd have to look at the whole context of the situation. Well, you can't just move on and, uh, when there's such, such an injustice. It still eats at you. Hello, I'm Todd Lamoran. Tonight on APTN Investigates, Kathleen Martins has a story about the death of Juliet Papaquan, a young woman fighting cancer who wanted to die in hospital. There are two distinct sides to this story. One is how her family thought Tabacon would be treated at the end of her life, and the other is the reality of how she was treated. Honoring Bear Woman is a story about pain and conflict, not between Tabacon and her deadly disease, but between her family and people working in the healthcare system. A tragic situation that started with a surreal scene that we now reenact for you. Julia Tapaquan, we're the Regina Police. Did you threaten to kill a doctor? The hospital reported a death threat. You're coming with us. Juliet's mom was making lunch when the phone rang. I was so shocked, like shocked. I couldn't, I didn't know what to say. I heard this voice crying on the other side of the phone. Her daughter was in the palliative care unit for an assessment. Juliet was nearing the end of a five-year battle with cervical cancer. Well, what I remember recall is that I, I said, where are your sisters? I said, maybe you should phone them or maybe, or maybe come home in a cab, Julie. Joyce wanted to rush over but couldn't drive because she is blind. She had to wait for her other daughters to get Juliet from the hospital. There were a lot of people looking. I mean, you have this, this little hundred pound, little, you know, frail, very sick woman, you know, and the two police officers behind, behind her. Lisa says the police officers marched Juliet right to the front door to make sure she was leaving. She made some kind of remark through a text message to her doctor and from that the doctor took that as a threat and called the police and got her escorted out of the hospital. The incident nearly destroyed Joyce, a mental health therapist who works in addictions. What else bothers me about it is the humiliation of the escort of the police service. The Pasqua Hospital and the Regina Quapel Health Region won't discuss the incident. I'm Karen Nerdshaw and I'm Vice President of Integrated Health Services with Regina Quapel Health Region and I have uh, responsibility for primary health care. Karen Earnshaw used to work as a nurse. Now she represents the hospital. I can't speak specifically about this and if I were to even reply, you know, sort of give that general answer, it's, it's too specific to this case. Juliet's family says she was kicked off the ward because of a message she texted to her home care nurse. They said she told them she was barred from returning to the hospital and ordered to stay off its property. Her mom thinks it was because Juliet was Aboriginal. Juliet suffered stereotyping and racism in the hospital when she was there and she died tragic with no no medical specialist, pain specialist with her, no, no nothing. We'd show you the controversial text, but Juliet no longer has the phone. She died six months after being kicked out of the hospital. It was October 2nd, 2014. What happened in the palliative care unit here in Regina has been kept under wraps until now. But that hasn't stopped the family from negotiating with health officials trying to get an apology and maybe some compensation. They've also got plans for something bigger, something they say will prevent another family from going through what they did. The Tapaquans live in Regina. They're still coming to grips with what happened to Juliet, saying she experienced racism all of her life and now, again, at the time of her death. 
I've experienced a lot of racism. So you know what it is? Yeah. And then you see it happening to your sister who's dying. Exactly. It's not a nice sight. What really hurt the family was the lack of compassion shown to a dying woman. One who Lisa says made an uncharacteristic outburst. I just couldn't believe how they handled the situation. It's hurtful, huh? Yes. And, and why do you think they acted that way? I have no idea. I think it, part of it was because she's Aboriginal. Juliet was born outside Regina on Carry the Kettle First Nation. She grew up watching and participating in traditional ceremonies, earning the name Bear Woman from her kukum. I think about her, how strong she was, how, how her, her traditional name made her who she was on her end of life journey. Her family says Juliet was in constant pain and not sleeping when she went into the palliative care unit in April 2014. Upset by the doctor, she texted, I want to slap that bitch, to her trusted confidant, her home care nurse. Juliet didn't know the nurse forwarded the message to the doctor, who was standing in the room at the time. We're talking about someone maybe 80 some pounds there, was not uh, capable of anything. Bob Hughes is an advocate for the family. He works for the Saskatchewan Coalition Against Racism. Here we've got a specialist dealing with someone in palliative care where comfort and pain control is, is really what it's about. And they're escorted out of the hospital using the uh, excuse of, you know, concern of a threat. Hughes says the police officers came to the same conclusion because they didn't arrest Juliet or charge her with a crime. Despite the home care nurse allegedly telling the doctor, Juliet was associated with violent street gang members. Was Julie prone to making threats against people? No. I think she just took, she just said it like out of just just anger. I mean, yeah. it's it's nothing that she would have done. I know my sister and she was not violent. And, and, and that is part of the reason why I think she, she said that was because she trusted that nurse. We know that nurse. She was a part of the family, like basically like a part of the family. Lisa says Juliet wasn't tied to any gang and she shouldn't have been treated like a criminal. It's well known. I mean, it's even well known by the, the, these people here that systemic racism is a problem. Hughes has heard other complaints from Aboriginal people saying they were discriminated against in the Saskatchewan healthcare system. But he says what happened to Juliet is the worst. The value they put on, uh, on this woman before they moved her out of there, there was some judgments too, about, uh, some uh, stereotypical thought, uh, comments made also, uh, you know, about her uh, acquaintances and that kind of thing about around the danger to the doctor and that which was was outrageous. Report, for example, Earnshaw seems uncomfortable yes. hearing that any of the 11,000 people working in the health region are racist. She says the organization serves communities across southern Saskatchewan including 17 First Nations. Do we have we um, solved it all? No, but I don't know that um, we're gonna, I don't know that that's something that you can turn around overnight. But as a vice president, uh, and you know, to quote the prime minister, it is 2016, is it acceptable to you to hear still a charge of racism? Well, acceptable is such a judgmental term that it means that you, yeah, that you, um, I get to decide whether somebody can say something is racist. That's what, you know, to me that's what accept, acceptance means. So I don't, I don't want to say it's acceptable or it's not acceptable. I think it's concerning. It has been two years since Juliet died. The Tapaquans still don't have answers to these questions after meeting with hospital officials. Why were police called instead of hospital security? Why was Juliet permanently kicked out of the only palliative care unit in the city? 
Why was she left without a follow-up care plan and pain prescriptions? These doctors should take accountability and they should be reprimanded. That's what I said. And I never heard anything after that. And they told me that I would never know what reprimand they got those doctors and that nurse. I would never know that. To your knowledge, does that doctor who called the police on Julie, does she still work there? You know what? To my knowledge, she's working there. And to, from that nurse that is working, that nurse, that text message doc, doctor, she's still working there. The health region won't name the doctor or nurse involved, nor would they let us speak with them. The Regina Police Service also denied our request to interview the officers that responded to the call. Could you imagine for me, for my family, or anybody to go into palliative care and you know there's, you know there's racism there and stereotyping? Juliet was survived by three children and many nieces and nephews. Her family says the young people are traumatized, while the adults remain conflicted about supporting Juliet's last wish to die in a hospital. Has it made you think about your own, own end of life care? You would like to have, where you would like to be or, or how you'd like it to be done? Well, I'm hoping by then things will, will change. <laughs> More compassion, more compassion, not seeing the color of a person's skin, just the person for who they are. When someone is dying, you expect them to be treated with care and compassion. But what happened to Julia Tapaquan seemed to go from bad to worse. Julia Tapaquan would pass away in October of 2014, but not before encountering even more problems from what appeared to be an uncaring healthcare system, especially when it came to her Soto culture. Here's part two of Honoring Bear Woman. Lisa Tapaquan hangs her sister's smiling face on the family wall. That's okay. That's good right there. That's ever cute. <laughs> Oh, it's, it's funny how things like bring bad memories when you look at yeah. pictures of I mean, seen good memories. Yeah. A picture from a happier time. Not when Juliet was dying at the Pasqua Hospital in Regina. Well, I remember this one time I went to see her. She had like puke on her face and down her chest here and on her clothing. And I, was, and I was just kind of like, what? Like, you know, what's going on? Because she shouldn't be looking like that. Lisa's daughter, Raven Tapaquan, remembers her auntie every day thanks to this tattoo on her left shoulder. She says those last days in a cold, lonely hospital room were rough. The, the room she was placed in was just the bed and like some, some signs on the walls like, wash your hair for, you know, $10, they'll come and wash your hair, or, you know, stuff like that. Not at all comfortable at all. Like, I would never want something like that, you know, for anybody. Juliet was let back into the Pasqua in September 2014, a few weeks before she died, but not in the palliative care ward. She was put on the general ward after the family says the hospital's Native Services Agency intervened on their behalf. They didn't want her there. That's just shocking that a hospital would do that. It's very shocking. It's very shocking. It's very shocking. These are, these are people are professional people. Native Services is located on the main floor of the hospital. It has this beautiful sacred space for praying, smudging and feasting. But it's only open during regular business hours not evenings or weekends. And that became another problem for the Tapaquan family. 
Juliet wanted to smudge so many times. There was no place to smudge there. There was no, you know, the native services were locked. Juliet died in the middle of the night when no one from native services was available. I would have liked the elder to go to pray for Julie on her life, end of her life journey. I would have liked the elder to be there in the room with us, to do the prayers for my daughter, to, to, to talk to her. That's why the Tapaquans are speaking out, to make sure cultural support is there when Aboriginal patients need it. We couldn't do nothing, nothing related to our culture there. We couldn't do nothing. Like, there was nobody, there was nobody there, nobody, nobody. Nobody who understood, it sounds like. Nobody understood. This letter obtained by APTN Investigates was sent to the family earlier this year. It was the first piece of correspondence they received. It doesn't mention racism or single out any employees. It does say officials are so sorry for compounding the sorrow and grief associated with Juliet's death. Adding, it is the goal of the RQHR to provide competent, compassionate care to patients and families. It is apparent we fell short of that goal while caring for Juliet. Karen Earnshaw has seen the letter. She says changes have and will be made when it comes to traditional care. Most notably, she says families can now smudge with proper permission and advance notice so the smoke detectors can be turned off. They certainly could, um, with the right support from the right folks. Um, not unlike in any of our um, any of our locations, you know. I, I I can tell you that in our those little small hospitals out there in rural, you know, we have okay. that process. So now you're confident that would happen, whereas maybe even two years ago that wasn't necessarily the case. Yeah, I, I wouldn't. I would never stand up and say that I'm 100% confident because, again, I told you that you know we're 11,000 people, but we've worked hard to make sure that that information is shared. The letter acknowledges traditional needs are important, and says they should be met even after hours. So everyone working in palliative care will get training. Noting cultural awareness and sensitivity has been added to new employee orientation and will be added to yearly education days. Training specific to death and dying has been identified as a priority and will also be included. Earnshaw then shared something that wasn't in the letter. She said the threat was recorded in Juliet's chart, hanging over her throughout her time in the system. So that um elevation of risk, that becomes part of the care plan for that particular patient. It's no different than we assess people for a risk of falls, we assess people for a risk of um, elopement, so in long, you know, that's, and then that is, that becomes part of your care plan. A palliative care researcher in Thunder Bay is saddened to learn what happened to Juliet. Holly Prince says the Tapaquan family is not alone in giving the system a failing grade. She says she heard many horror stories while studying end-of-life experiences on First Nations. So why is that, that a First Nation community um, has to host bingos and fundraisers to be able to purchase a bed for their own community? And that's a real experience and that's a real story in one of the communities that I worked in. They actually had to fundraise to be able to purchase a bed. Prince found huge gaps in service for First Nations people wanting to die at home because there is no dedicated funding or program for palliative care on Canada's reserves. She says bands struggle to plug the holes with home care funding from provincial and federal governments, but it's not enough, leaving patients without much needed equipment and access to medication. For the most part, because there's no care or services, people have to leave their communities and they're dying in urban hospitals, regional hospitals, hospices, long-term care units outside their community because the community just can't support that person at end of life. Prince poured five years of research into this workbook, a guide to developing palliative care for First Nations people by First Nations people. She says any community can use it and make it their own. We have always cared for our own people. We have always done that. And I think it's just about us reclaiming that as Indigenous people. She extended her sympathy to the Tapaquan family 
knowing how important it was for culture and ceremony to be part of Juliet's death. I know in my experience when my mother was dying, um, we had a private room at our local hospital and we were all together and my whole extended family was there um, and it's something that we needed to do. Only two people were allowed in Juliet's room at a time and visiting hours were enforced. Joyce says it added to her grief. I feel I was helpless. I wasn't a doctor. Mm -hmm. I wasn't a pain specialist. I wasn't anything but a mother trying to comfort my daughter. Mm -hmm. I had a a big lump in my throat. The family is still waiting for a public apology. It has also asked the health region to help restore the missing spiritual element in Juliet's death by naming a sacred space after her like a medicine lodge in the inner city community the hospital serves. Bob Hughes says Juliet's death could bring real reform. It was a chance to say, look, this was, you know, systemic racism within the, in the systems is just, I mean, that's a given. <laughs> Everyone should know that. And so you get, you get past that. Don't take it personally and, uh, and say, yeah, we made, this was a terrible thing. But he says talks between the hospital and family have ground to a halt. I've seen it though slipping um, the determination, especially from the people we've met with, is more on trying to help uh, Joyce uh, move on. Uh, maybe Joyce and the family move on. Nikki! Oh, how are you doing? What's your day, my sister? Okay. See you later. He says it would be a mistake to underestimate the Tapaquan family. Joyce and her family are very, very, very strong. <laughs> and I have no intention of us walking away from this until there's justice in this case. Meanwhile, Joyce says she'll stay on the path feeling it's up to her to complete Juliet's journey. It's supposed to be about caring for people. It's supposed to be about loving people, no matter what color you were. You know, no, no matter what color you were. Juliet has been gone for two years, leaving a big hole in the family and what they say is an unfulfilled promise to honour her memory. The Regina Coppell Health Region may be pushing them to move on, but the Tapaquans tell ABTN Investigates they are digging in to hear a public apology. They want to see a sacred space open in the community as a gesture of reconciliation for all Aboriginal people who depend on the hospital. Next week, Rob Smith looks at reaction to a plan to build a liquefied natural gas plant. It's to be located on an island off the coast of northern British Columbia. I'm Todd Lamoran. Have a great evening.